Hello and welcome back to Toronto's AI and Robotics Seminar. Um, today's talk is uh, will be given by uh, Lukas Bunke and his talk um, title is Safe Learning in Robotics, Safety Learning, Uncertain Dynamics. Lukas Bunke is a PhD student at the University of Toronto for Aerospace Studies, retired, and a student affiliated of the Rector Institute, Toronto, Canada. He is a member of the Dynamic System Lab, where he is supervised by Professor Angela Schillig. His research focused on safety learning-based control with a focus on system where full state measurement is unavailable. He received the bachelor's and master's degree from Hamburg University of Technology and spent time at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent System, the Uni University of the, um, California, Berkeley, and the National University of Singapore. Okay, um, Lucas, uh, let's get started. The stage is yours. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? And you, I mean, I'm assuming you see my slides. Um, all right. So, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, thank you for having me at the AI and Robotics Seminar. Um, so, welcome to my presentation on safe learning and robotics. Um, safely learning uncertain dynamics. And this is joint work with my lab at the University of Toronto. And I will be mostly presenting part of our recent survey on safe learning in robotics. So today's robotics applications are largely made possible by control theory. Um, however, the progress of machine learning and reinforcement learning in other fields like computer vision and natural language processing promises to enable the development of learning-based approaches to improve the performance of controllers, which will be necessary to make automation truly pervasive. However, there are a couple of challenges on the road towards deployable learning controllers. And this include um, the transfer of results from simulation to the real world, uh, computational efficiency, and most importantly, safety, which is what I'll be focusing uh, mostly in this talk. In recent years, uh, there has been a lot of research uh, which has been exploring how to extend safe and robust control frameworks with learning, and also how to scale reinforcement learning beyond toy problems while encouraging safety. Um, OK, let's take a look at the different approaches toward robotics. And um, we'll start with the classical control approaches that typically consider a set of well-defined robot dynamics and environments. And these are also referred to model-driven approaches. And here, only a small portion of the world can be accurately modeled. So this is shown by the safe region here in green. And there's a clear boundary between what can be accurately modeled and what, what cannot be accurately modeled. And it is possible to give guarantees within the specific context, but generalization to, for example, new operating conditions is typically challenging. For the data-driven approaches, we can learn a model of the world over time by collecting data. However, there's usually not a clear boundary between what can be actually accurately modeled and what cannot be accurately modeled. And this allows for high generalizability, but providing guarantees is usually challenging. Finally, we have the combination of the two approaches, uh, which promises generalizability with guarantees. And using a model and learning together allows to improve the model of the world over time by collecting data and additionally, the safe region can be extended by explorative actions with a predefined risk. Our goal is the safe deployment of learning algorithms on real world robotic systems. And towards this goal, we have come up with three sub goals. The first one is the providing an overarching review of the progress made in safe learning control in the last half decade. And also to move towards a common language that the control and reinforcement learning community can understand and use for um, sharing their results. Second, we want to develop simple but meaningful benchmark scenarios to en enable quantitative comparisons of safe learning based control and reinforcement learning. And finally, we want to foster interdisciplinary re research that can effectively leverage insights from both the control theory and machine learning literature and community. And we've been doing this through. Um, outreach events and workshops at robotics, control, and machine learning conferences. 
Okay, so towards these goals, we have been working on first our safe learning and robotics review paper that is to be published in the annual reviews later this year. Um, and I will be covering one section of this review paper in this talk. Um, then also the development of our safe control gym benchmark suite um, towards providing a common benchmarking environment for control and reinforcement learning algorithms. And the code here is open source and we have uh, recently released our preprint uh, version of the paper. And finally, our safe learning and robotics website where we have gathered all our results and resources and we also provide info on all upcoming workshops and events um, that we've been organizing. Okay, so the safe learning control problem has three components. First, we have the system model that describes the system behavior uh, with dynamics F, the state X, control input U, and process noise W. In reinforcement learning, uh, this is described by the transition probability function. Second, we have the objective function that determines the task um, by a cost function. And in reinforcement learning, the objective is described by a reward function. Finally, we have the safety constraints that encode, encode the system safety by specifying state and input constraints, and also the notion of stability. An example can be seen here at the bottom where the dynamics describe the motion of the robot. The task is to follow a reference trajectory um, while staying inside uh, lane boundaries, which act as the constraints. The difficulty of this is to guarantee the constraint satisfaction, although there, there can be uncertainty in all three of the components. And with regards to the safety constraints, we distinguish among three levels of safety. We have safety level one, which allows minimal safety constraint violation, such that failures are possible. The safety level two, guarantee safety constraint satisfaction with a predefined probability, and safety level three, which guarantees that there will be no constraint violations at all time steps. Okay, we can plot different robot decision-making approaches over this 2D plot. The x-axis here is showing the uncertainty in the dynamics um, and or the environment, and the y-axis is showing the safety guarantees going from no guarantees to hard constraint satisfaction, so safety level three. Classical control approaches typically start with the prior model of the robot. And the model of the robot encodes our domain knowledge about the system. By exploiting the system structure, we can provide different levels of safety guarantees. And common control techniques include, for example, model predictive control, adaptive control, and robust control, which we will cover in more detail in this talk. So here we show an example where a model-based control approach is used to allow a mobile manipulator to track a straight line while avoiding obstacles. Here we see the mobile manipulator is manually driven by a user while the base is controlled to avoid obstacles. So model-based approaches are very effective when the robot dynamics and the environment can be well characterized. Reinforcement learning, or RL in short, is the standard machine learning framework to address the problem of sequential decision-making under uncertainty. Unlike traditional control, RL typically does not rely on a a priori dynamics model and can be directly applied to uncertain dynamics. RL approaches can be generally categorized as model-based, where we explicitly learn the dynamics of the system, or as model-free. And model-free approaches include value function-based methods, where the goal is to learn a value function or policy optimization methods where the goal is to directly find a optimal policy. Reinforcement learning has been applied to solve complex, complex tasks such as solving the Rubik's cube with a robotic hand. However, there are still practical challenges to the deployment of RL algorithms in real world robotics problems. And some of these challenges include the continuous and possibly high dimensional statement inputs in robotics, learning robust policies from very limited samples, the interpretability of the learned policies, and most importantly, providing a priori safety guarantees. So how are these approaches mapped to real world applications? Um, for this, we can also plot the different, different robotic applications over this same 2D plot. 
Traditional approaches typically operate in well-characterized environments like industrial robots or airplanes. Uh, autonomous vehicles or surgical robots deal with much higher uncertainty in their environment. However, high safety levels are still required to avoid collisions uh, or injuries at all costs. Uh, low velocity delivery robots and household robots face similar uncertainties, but collisions are not necessarily safety critical. Um, in this talk, we want to investigate some of the approaches that can deal with less structured environments while still providing um, high safety guarantees. So in the recent literature, we see an effort from both the control and the RL communities to do, develop safe learning control algorithms that combine model-based and data-driven approaches. Um, and in our review paper, we cover recent advances in safe decision-making under uncertainties, and we divided the methods into three sections. Um, the first section introduces safe learning control approaches where machine learning models are safely incorporated into control frameworks to improve the performance. In the second section, we cover safe and robust reinforcement learning algorithms. And in the last section, we introduce safety filter and certification methods that can augment um, arbitrary learning controllers that were not initially designed to be safe uh, to have safety guarantees. And our goal in safe robot learning is to leverage expressive models while still providing strong safety guarantees. Okay, so while our review paper covers all of these three sections, um, in this talk, I'll only be focusing on safe learning control approaches. Um, and the other two sections are, will be covered by tutorial videos that we will release very soon. Okay, we will start with an overview. Sorry, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Can we can we go back to the previous slide? Yes. So yeah, so I think so. This slide makes it looks like um, uh, the notions of safety and reinforcement learning and the notions of uh, you know safety certificates and you know we have one of stability and you know controlled barrier functions are completely separate. Is that uh, the intended message, or is that, uh, or am I misinterpreting the, the figure? Um, I mean, I mean, the figure is definitely simplifying. Um, yeah, yeah simpl simplifying it. So there's like definitely um, there's not there's not a not a clear boundary between all of these methods, um, and most of and then also like for the safety certificate certificate filters and um, also for safety learning on certain dynamics. Um, you like in most often like in practice certain approximations are made such that this does not always end up um to actually like yeah like satisfy all these like boundaries that are shown in this in this diagram um so yeah this is just this is a very simplifying figure for sure sure just wanted to point out that there are methods uh existing methods both from the last couple of years but also in all their literature where you could get you know, hard guarantees about the performance of RL, uh, about the safety of RL methods, maybe at the expense of uh, performance, but uh, you you do have a number of papers at the intersection of the two. Um, so, yeah. uh, but I, I understand the, the general uh, statement. Uh, yeah. The majority, in the majority of cases, yes. Uh, yeah. Probably how the image looks like. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a good point. It is a simplifying figure. Um, and yeah, not every paper fits uh, directly into this into this diagram. It's inside the exact box where it might be um, considered to be in. Gotcha, cool, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, so we will start with an overview of traditional control approaches and then discuss how machine learning has been used to augment these methods while still providing safety guarantees. So here I will just show the very basic idea behind three major underlying control techniques uh, for learning-based control on the example of reference tracking. So in adaptive control, the idea is to update uncertain model parameters to stabilize the system. For example, the vehicle's length and mass can be updated over time to track the reference. So here, shown in the figure by varying uh, sizes of the robot. In robust control, the idea is to stabilize the system for a set of possible uncertainties. 
And the goal is to be robust to any errors in the model such that the controller allows reference tracking for a variety of different model parameters or noises. Finally, a model predictive control or MPC in short can account for stated input constraints and uses its dynamic model to predict into the future over a finite horizon. We will discuss this technique and a robust version of MPC in a bit. Okay, now let's look at classical adaptive control and how machine learning has been integrated with adaptive control for improved performance. Let's um, take this discrete time dynamics system and without loss of generality, we can decompose the dynamics of the robot into a nominal component and an uncertain component. And classical approaches typically consider an a priori model structure with parametric uncertainties. And the uncertain parameters can be updated using, for example, the output of based approaches to achieve closed loop stability, or using model reference adaptive control such that the system behaves as a predefined stable reference model. In recent literature, an effort has been made uh, to combine machine learning and adaptive control techniques to learn uncertain dynamics from data. And there are three main ideas to incorporate machine learning into adaptive control approaches. The first one is um, using machine learning to account for non-parametric unknown dynamics. Uh, the second one is to use probabilistic learning to account for the learned model uncertainty to achieve cost adaptation. And finally, to augment adaptive control with deep learning approaches uh, with experience memorization in order to minimize the need for readaptation. Uh, robust control is another approach for decision-making under uncertainties. And instead of adapting the uncertain parameters online, robust control typically considers a set of possible unknown dynamics or disturbances. And then safety is guaranteed for a set of uncertain systems. Robustly stable closed loop systems can be obtained by H-infinity and H2 control design techniques, uh, the apanov based approaches or passivity-based approaches. And machine learning techniques have been incorporated in robust control design to reduce the conservatism and stabilization tasks or to improve the performance by learning feedback linearization errors uh, for tracking tasks. Here we see an example where a Gaussian process is used in combination with a standard linear robust control design. And so learning from data reduces the conservatism of the robust controller and improves the performance. So here we see the performance of the initial controller using only 800 data points. And by including additional data, the quad order can reliably return to the hover position. So while adaptive control and robust control do not explicitly account for state input constraints, they do account for stability. A technique that can also handle um, constraints is model predictive control, or in short, MPC. At every time step, MPC solves optimization problem. And here we consider a 2D discrete time linear system where the goal is to stabilize the system to the origin. And this plot is showing the first element of the state vector over the time steps. We have our initial condition at x1 is equal to 2.4. And now MPC uses a dynamics model to predict a finite number of steps into the future. So here we have our prediction. And the reason why the controller does not immediately plan to steer the system to the origin is the trade-off in the objective between penalizing stabilization errors versus penalizing large control inputs. And after planning the trajectory, uh, the first optimal control input is applied to the system, the horizon is shifted, and the MPC replants again. Again, takes the first control input, shift the horizon, replan, and so on and so forth until the system stabilizes at the origin. OK, so after seeing the example, I'll give some more detail on the optimization problem that is solved for MPC at every time step. So we have uh, the cost function that defines the objective, for example, stabilization or reference tracking, the dynamics model, in this case, a linear discrete time system. For example, this describes how control inputs um, affect a quad order uh, motion. We have the state and input constraints. The state constraints uh, can encode areas of the state space that the quad order is not supposed to, supposed to fly into, like the ceiling or the floor. 
And we also have input constraints um, for actuation limits, for example. For example, the quad orders mo motors can only generate a limited thrust. And under certain conditions, MPC can guarantee stability and constraint satisfaction. However, these guarantees assume that the nominal model is equal to the true system. Um, let's consider the case where, the, where we have model mismatch. So again, we use the same discrete time linear system as an example. And let us just uh, plot the result, uh, the previous result where we had no model mismatch. And now when we like plan using the incorrect model, um, we first see, okay, that our plan trajectory very much um, aligns with the no model mismatch closed loop trajectory. But now if we start taking the first control input from this um, plan trajectory, we see that we end up in a different state, like slightly. And now if we continue doing this, planning with an incorrect model, we further and further get away from the no model mismatch closed loop trajectory until we actually end up in an infeasible state. And here we can see the model mismatch um, directly. Lucas, if I may ask, do you assume here like a closed loop setting or is it open loop? Oh, yeah, it is. It's like the MPC is running closed loop, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is an example how model mismatch affects um, MPC, for example. Um, so this is, this is a problem. And so one way to deal with such a model mismatch is robust MPC. And MP robust MPC allows to account for uncertainties and model mismatch in the dynamics. And a common technique for robust MPC is tube-based MPC. And under the assumption of bounded uncertainty, stability and constraint satisfaction can be guaranteed. And so with this bounded uncertainty, we can determine an error tube that contains the errors between the true and the nominal model for all future time steps. And using this error tube, we can reduce the set of constraints such that a reduced uh, set of the state input constraints accounts for the uncertainties in the system. Okay, so to guarantee that the true system adheres to the true state and input constraints, we require that a nominal or noiseless system adheres to reduced state and input constraints. And the idea is that if the nominal state is inside the reduced state constraints, then by accounting for the error tube, the true system will be inside the true state constraints. Okay, so now I'll show you the optimization problem that we'll solve for this. And again, we have the objective function with our linear dynamics, noiseless, so there's no noise. Um, and now with reduced state and input constraints here in indicated by the bar. And we have a little example here on the right where the goal is to stabilize an uncertain linear system to the origin. And there's a constraint on x2 less or equal to two using robust MPC. The reduced constraint is shown in the, uh, with the red dashed line. And the normal system is required to stay beneath this line for state constraint satisfaction for the true system. We have our initial condition here in blue and the tube around this initial condition is shown in red. And the center of this tube um, is the normal state. Now, if we apply the robust MPC, the trajectory of the true system is shown in blue and the normal trajectory is shown in, as the dashed line. Now, if we keep running uh, the robust MPC, the true trajectory never leaves the red shaded area given by the tube. And using this controller, the system can be stabilized to a neighborhood around the origin, um, although the true system has um, uncertainties. So, but um, while this works and we can guarantee constraint satisfaction even under uncertainties, there are also some problems. Usually uh, for a poor nominal model, it may not be possible to find a tube for which the problem is still feasible. And typically robust MPC is often overly conservative. So now we will present three methods where learning has been used with robust MPC to improve the performance. The first one is to learn a separate model for performance. The second one is to consider only parametric uncertainty and adaptively adapting, updating the tube in robust MPC. And finally, using a Gaussian process to improve the model and update the tube in robust MPC. We will now talk about these three approaches in more detail. Um, so the first idea is to augment a standard robust MPC control with a separate learned performance model. So again, we have our objective function, 
our nominal model and our reduced state input constraints. So this formulation already guarantees constraint satisfaction despite the uncertainty in the nominal model. The idea is now to introduce an additional performance model that for, can, for example, be learned um, from, from data using a neural network. And then um, optimize the cost objective using this new performance model. In this approach, the nominal model is used to guarantee safety, while the learned performance is used to optimize the performance. In this idea, safety and performance are completely decoupled. Another idea is to combine adaptive control and robust model predictive control to consider parametric uncertainties. In this approach, the standard robust model predictive control formulation is considered, but uh, the nominal model now contains only parametric uncertainty or unknown parameters. For example, in this case, we have a linear model with unknown parameters theta. The idea is that the initially a conservative parameter set is considered. For example, in the image here, there are two unknown parameters. There's theta one on the x-axis and theta two on the y-axis. And the initial conservative parameter set we, we know is described by the light red box. While the true unknown parameter, parameter is given by the X in the top left corner. And so during execution, the parameter set is reduced as more data from the system is added. This is highlighted by the reduced parameter set in a stronger red. The key is that by reducing this parameter set, we get closer to knowing our true system dynamics. And this shrinks the tube, which leads to less conservative constraints and as such improved performance. Uh, Lucas, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so is the, um, is the reduction in uncertainty here somehow encoded in the loss function? So are you doing dual control here? Uh, no, this is actually not doing dual control, yeah. Um, but you, be, you could also add that into the, into the objective function. But this is just, um, yeah, not, not, doing, not accounting for any exploration actions. But yeah, definitely um, something that you could add. So, so here, no exploration is done, but as you're getting more, uh, as you're getting more data uh, about the dynamics, you update your model, uh, your dynamics yes. model, and, but there's nothing steering the system to uh, probe the dynamics. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is just, um, yeah, this example is just for the stabilization, yeah, but you could add a term for exploration as well. Got it. Uh, and you were talking previously about, um, um, dynamics mismatch, model mismatch. Mm -hmm. uh, and in adaptive control, uh, you know, you might end up with a case where you misidentify your parameters as long as they help you achieve, you know, good task performance. Yeah. Uh, would that be a case of model mismatch or as long as you get guarantees about performance, you're okay with that type of model mismatch? And I think in that case, it's okay. I mean, if, if you are still able to like, even like using like an incorrect parameter, if you're still able to stabilize the system, for example, then I think that's okay. Okay, thank you. I have also one question, if I may. Um, yeah, sure. It's about so basically the the system is linear, but what about the dependency of a and b on theta? This can this be arbitrary nonlinear, or is uh, theta just some entry in, or like a linear function of entries in the matrix? Yeah, this is this is also just um, also like a linear dependency, actually. Yeah, in this case. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I'll continue. Um, another practical approach um, is to use a Gaussian process. And in this approach, the true dynamics is modeled as a nominal model with some additional dynamics that we want to be, want to learn. And so we want to solve a regression problem by fitting a Gaussian process to the residual between the true dynamics and the nominal dynamics. And a Gaussian process is a distribution over infinitely many functions. And here's an example of a prior of a Gaussian process with a constant mean function in blue and the variance in light blue. And as we observe a data point, uh, using uh, Bayesian inference, we can refine the set of possible functions. More specifically, we update the mean function and reduce the variance as observed in the figure. As we collect more data points, we can refine this even more. 
we often, recons we often consider two to three standard deviations to represent the worst case scenario. In other words, we have the true function is within two to three standard deviations of the mean function based on the observed data. And now we can use this learned Gaussian process model in a robust NPC. So to incorporate the Gaussian process model into a robust NPC formulation, we again consider our standard robust NPC formulation. Um, except that we consider that the dynamics can be written as our nominal model plus some unknown model uh, function f hat. And the nominal model is updated with the mean function of the Gaussian process. While the variance of the Gaussian process updates the tube to reduce the state and input constraints. In practice, we often consider two to three standard deviations, which makes the reduced constraints probabilistic in nature. Now, as more data is added, the variance of the Gaussian process reduces, which in turn reduces the tube and results in less restrictive state and input constraints. The value of the Gaussian process approach is that it allows for both updating the model using the mean function and reducing the tube using the variance as more data is added. Um, we now have a little video of the approach that uses a Gaussian process in practice for navigating a ground vehicle using vision. The constraints are given by the tracks, the orange cones, while the uncertainty tube is represented by the purple area on the plot. In trial one, when there's no data, we have a very large uncertainty. This means that the vehicle has strict tightened constraints and must act very conservatively. In trial three, we have used the previously seen data to update a GP model. The uncertainty or tube in purple is reduced, allowing for better but still safe performance. Okay, so to summarize the discussed approaches, the performance of traditional adaptive, robust, and MPC approaches are usually limited by our understanding of the system dynamics. Um, for learning-based approaches, the performance can be safely improved by incorporating data. Okay, so during our review, we found that there are four major open challenges for safe robot learning. And the first one is that many approaches make assumptions on the class of dynamic systems that can be handled. And one challenge is to extend the existing approaches to hybrid dynamics and soft robotics. Um, then another challenge is that most approaches assume that all states can be measured and that there's no measurement noise. And this is often not the case in practice. And addressing the issue of imperfect state measurements and reliably dealing with high dimensional sensor data inputs promises to improve safety guarantees for real world robot applications. Um, then many approaches have only been, been shown to work on low dimensional systems and scaling these to high dimensional real world robotic systems is a challenge as well as providing guarantees with only little available data. Finally, uh, safety is only guaranteed if the assumptions that we make when designing the controller are satisfied. And these assumptions need to be reliably checked online. Okay, I want to conclude by shortly highlighting our other efforts with regards to safe learning in robotics. And let's have a brief look at our safe control gym. Um, in the main section of our paper, we reviewed 80 papers. And every paper provides a different um, evaluation of their uh, controllers. And some common evaluations are numerical examples, grid worlds, physics-based simulations, and some real robotic systems. But especially there's a discrepancy on what the control and our L communities validate their algorithms on. Furthermore, out of the 80 papers, only about 30% of the papers provide hardware experiments. And this shows that it's still challenging to run many of the proposed algorithms in real time um, in practice, while also guaranteeing the satisfaction of all assumptions. We also saw that less than 20% of the papers provide open source implementations, and this affects reproducibility and discourages comparison among different algorithms. Um, and this motivated the development of our own open source benchmark suite uh, called Safe Control Gem. And with the, the, the goal to design a safe control gym that is simple to use, friendly to both the RL and control communities, provides realistic disturbances and a priori dynamics models with state and input constraints for safe learning control. And many example controllers have already been implemented um, by us, including 
standard controllers and standard reinforcement learning algorithms, as well as approaches uh, covered in our review paper. And we will be adding more algorithms in the next couple of weeks. And um, I encourage you to check it out. Um, finally, on our Safe Robot Learning website, you will also find past and upcoming events. And um, I want to highlight two upcoming events happening in mid-December. First, we have our deployable decision-making in embodied systems workshop at NeurIPS with a great lineup of speakers, spotlight talks, and a poster session. And second, we have the invited session on learning-based control at CDC with four sessions on learning-based control. We'll be excited to see you there. Um, yeah, with that, I want to end the talk. Here's a, just a picture of the team that is behind all of this effort. And yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to hear more of your questions. Hey, thanks, Lucas, for, for the great talk. Um, yeah, let's let's start with the Q and A session. Um, I can ask a question if nobody has a question. Yes, go ahead. So, Lucas, thanks for, thanks for the great talk. Um, I think there's a divide between the two communities uh, in terms of when we talk about safety between the RL community and the control uh, theory community in the sense that uh, it seems like the RL folks are a bit more um, open for their robots to make mistakes. Uh, and they're trying to minimize, provide bounds on the number of mistakes that the robot will make. But they take it as a given that, uh, you know, if you do uh, T uh, experiments, you want to have either a constant, uh, you know, a quantity of mistakes that is you know, O of one, uh, so independent of T, or a log T type of uh, maximum upper bound on the on the number of um, mistakes you're going to make as a function of the number of experiments you, you do or deployments that you do. And it seems like in the control theory community, you want to keep that, not only you want to keep that number constant, but you want to keep it zero. Mm. Uh, do you have any, uh, how do you view this uh, this type of, dichotomy do you um, I mean surely there are applications for which you do want you know to make zero mistakes I want my plane to make zero mistakes but do you have any way of uh, looking at that uh, spectrum of you know how many mistakes you're allowed to make in uh, not super safety critical uh, application I mean I think that's, that's a great question and um, yeah definitely definitely a challenge um, and I think for the control community, this is, I mean, the, the, pro, the providing a um, like zero failures is also dependent on the assumptions that you make about your system. And if you make certain assumptions, you, you can provide certain guarantees. Um, but then the question is like, how do these assumptions actually transfer to the real world? And mm -hmm. in, in many cases, they need to be, we need to make certain uh, approximations then on, on real systems and then some of these assumptions may not hold anymore. And the guarantees that we previously had do not transfer to the real world. Mm -hmm. so, so then on the, in the real world, I think this is that control can always provide zero failures might, might also not be true. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think this is, yeah, it's a very important point that um, we need to, need to recognize that all, like usually like the number of failures um, or the level of safety is often a, a function of also of the assumptions that go into um, into building the system or like the controller. Got it. Thanks. So in in standard control design, as I understand, you still use uh, very classical methods and control engineers typically know uh, know their model very well. On the other hand, for RL, one of the main arguments is basically the big diversity of objects, physi and physi and basically their physical properties that you have to interact with. So, for the type of methods that you 
you discussed today between these, let's say, two extremes, where, where do you see their main applicability? Um, so for like the adaptive control, for example, or, um, yeah, I think it's also, also a good question. Um, I mean, as I said, I think like many of the control approaches uh, in particular uh, look at low dimensional uh, problems. Um, so scaling them, even like just like from a computational perspective might, might already be very challenging. So you cannot even like deal with such high dimensional problems with like many objects and, and um, vision-based inputs. Um, so but like, yeah, it's definitely um, interesting to see how these approaches could be used for like higher dimensional uh, systems, which are like more, more comparable to what RL is currently exploring. And what dimension do they start from, like from your viewpoint to be higher dimensional? Are we talking of like, I don't know, like dimension tens of dimensions or like more like images where you see have, let's say hundreds of dimensions. I mean, it probably would like start like tens. <laughs> yeah. I have a follow-up question if nobody, nobody has a question. So um, Lucas, yeah. uh, how do you, um, so can you, can you give me an example uh, or let me, let me rephrase the question this way. Right now you're, you're sort of talking about approaches where uh, the uncertainty is basically in a dynamics model uh, mm -hmm. and if I understand correctly, there's not a lot of uncertainty in the uh, in the boundaries of the safe set of in definition of what's safe and what's unsafe. Is that is that a fair statement? Um, yes, yeah, I mean, so many of the control approaches make the assumption that um, that we know the bound of the uncertainty. So, like the, the uncertainty is bounded, and we also know the bound, um, which which is also which is already I guess challenging to to do that in the real world. For example, right, but but also you know which states uh, are uh, you know safe and which states are unsafe. So you know the safety signal for uh, or the you know the boundaries of the safe set for all of these uh, cases. Or am I overgeneralizing? Um, I mean, I guess like it it, it could depend, but in um, in many cases you'll be able to at least. Um, determine exp approximation of, of the safe side, yeah. Okay, so just to invite you to, uh, to sort of uh, act as a devil, devil's advocate uh, and perhaps, um, can you provide uh, examples of uh, cases where you wouldn't know your safe set a priori in robotics and you would have to learn it from experimentation and exploration? So, so you want this, that to okay. this is not a this is not a trick question by the way. I'm genuinely curious about whether uh, because the 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 common approach that RL folks take, or you know one possible approach that is you know somewhat popular in the uh, from the from the RL side, is that uh, you you are going to discover which safe are which states are safe and which are unsafe. Maybe you have yeah. some prior knowledge about what that you know, that safe classifier might be, uh, but uh, you're gonna discover that classifier, uh, you know, from experience. So your constraints, your safety constraints are gonna evolve according to the experience that you get. Uh, mm. And it goes back to the discussion about in RL, you know, you're allowed to make some mistakes as long as they're not, as long as they're being reduced over time. Um, so I guess the question is, do we have any situations in a practical robotics setting where you'd be 100% justified in assuming that uh, you don't know the, the true safety set? Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, like, uh, like I think that goes like back to um, if you're a practitioner, like you, you know your system well, you like, you, you have an idea um, of, um, the, the dynamics and then you can design your, your controller and based on that you can probably like to define a set that is 
um, mostly contains only only safe states. Um, but the giving that guarantee and practice again, I think, is 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 challenging for sure. Yeah, I, I guess the question is not uh, can we provide that guarantee. The, the question is mostly. Uh, is there any practical scenario in robotics where you would start with the assumption that, hey, I'm not going to bother declaring uh, what the safe set is? Or, or is robotics sort of just fine uh, and uh, you, you can do everything you need in robotics by pre-declaring what your safety constraints are, knowing a priori what your safety constraints are? So is it more like, do we need these these um, safe sets or no? The question is: Do we need to learn these safe sets, or can or do we can we just uh, get along fine by uh, having them being pre-declared? Yeah, I mean, um, I think like standard control approaches where there's no adaptation or like no learning, um, the safe set is just predefined. Um, but because we might not know the system that well, um, it that might be very conservative. Mm -hmm. And then that might not be very economical to to do that. And I think that's like where the, the learning comes in or like using our observations to actually like increase or expand the safe set and to actually so that we can actually like find um, more optimal policies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Hi, Lucas. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so I was wondering in one of your earlier slides, you showed like the surgical robotics um, example below the, uh, the autonomous driving. Um, I think it was mm -hmm. in, in a very early slide. I think, I think you might be able to see it now, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so where does that assumption come from and also because like the the scene you are showing there is maybe mainly coming from like telemanipulated surgical robotics and not for mm -hmm. like a, an autonomous surgical robotics I, I know that that you are not doing research in that but i'm i'm just curious about um yeah where this ordering come from um yeah, I mean, like this, this, this ordering is is by no means um, accurate. Uh, this is just uh, this was just to give it like a an overview of like where certain applications might lie. Um, this is yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm not claiming that this is accurate or um, this is that this is like the order it should be. This is just like a very rough um, yeah classification of where these approaches could could lie. Potentially, like they could be. Um, need like higher safety levels or are even um, higher uncertainty in the dynamics. Um, yeah. Yeah, so for sure, right? So in like a surgical um, or in a surgical robotic scenario, you are just risking one person's life there. And maybe in like autonomous driving, you are risking several mm -hmm. or several people's life. But yeah, still, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't need to like weigh, um, weigh like the, I guess like the, um, the effects of like the different where like all like of like failures. Um, yeah, just like, to give like an idea. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, right now there's no question in the chat. Um, do we have more questions for Lucas? If so, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, I think um, we don't have more questions. Um, Thank you again for, uh, for the great talk and for, uh, for your answer. And um, thanks all uh, 
uh, Eshpen uh, to be here um, and make, um, yeah, to, to enjoy the talk. And um, let's close the session and say goodbye. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Lucas. It's been a yeah. great yeah. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you very much.